So this is um, the last week of lectures for this semester. And as I already told you, the remaining, is it, I guess, two weeks, yes, um, is only for exercises and questions for you. Now maybe we start at this point um, to repeat a little bit. Um, oh, there is a problem with the beamer. Yeah, the red is missing. Huh. Okay. So this will no. system. Okay, so this is the, the result for this Lotka Volterra uh, differential equation, uh, which is a simple model of the population dynamics uh, for a system with two kinds of populations, a predator-prey example. I mean, we could think of sheep um, as the prey and wolves as the predator. And what we see in the result is that we get a nice periodic behavior. Yeah? So both populations are um, deterministically periodic. Yeah? Um, and this behavior, we will uh, look at such behavior a little bit closer today. Uh, solutions of differential equations with periodic solutions or with non-periodic solutions. So we will look at other examples uh, where we, we, we can analyze this quite nicely. I mean the problem why the problem here is this differential equation, let's go back to it. Yeah. This system of two differential equations is nonlinear. And as soon as the differential equations are nonlinear. Mathematical analysis is getting quite hard. We will now look today at linear differential equations. And in this case, analysis is really nice and everything can be done symbolically. So we, we want to get some deeper understanding of what's going on by looking at the simple linear case. Okay, yes, what we also did last time, we looked at boundary value problems, which is quite different. An initial value problem as we had it here. Look, the initial value problem, I, I give two initial values, which is the population of the wolves at the beginning was one, and population of sheep at the beginning is three. So we have two initial values for two differential equations of first order. Uh, if I have one differential equation of first order, I need one initial value. For each extra coupled differential equation, I need one initial value if it's a first order system. Uh, so we need two initial values because it's a first order system. Uh, if it's a second order system, then either we need two initial values or uh, two boundary values. So if it would be a second order system, uh, not system, if it would be one equation of second order as it is here, um, 
Yeah, this is the general form of a second order differential equation, uh, one dimensional. Then either I need two initial values, which would be y of zero and y prime of zero, the, uh, the first derivative. Either we know these two derivatives at the left border of the interval, or we, need, uh, we know two values. One value at the left border and one at the right border. And that's what we then call a boundary value problem. And now these boundary value problems, they can't be solved with like the Euler method or runge kutta because these methods are iterative methods that start at the left uh, at the left margin of the interval look we have our interval a b and um, we are looking for this function y of what is it x here y of x and um, what we know is some initial value y of a and now by applying the runge kutta method for example I get successive points and get then a solution function but as you have seen this method iteratively starts with the initial value and then develops a solution over the whole interval. But now we do have uh, two boundary values, one here and one here, and it's no, no longer possible to start from one of the margins. And uh, what happens here is, again we have an iterative method, but what we do is, we start with some, with, we start by guessing um, an initial solution. Or uh, we could also say, heuristically do the simplest thing we can do. We just do a linear interpolation between the two margins. That's our initial approximate solution. And now we do fixed point iteration. Um, so what we derived last time was this system. This system. I mean this is a linear system. Um, which has to be solved, but unfortunately, and that's why we need fixed point iteration, unfortunately, uh, in order to determine our new y values, so in, in some inner point, um, suppose this is xn, and then we have, here we have yn, and here we have y n minus 1 and here we have I mean this guy here is y n plus 1 huh? or maybe we should better look here x n minus 1 x n plus 1 huh? in order to determine our new values yn plus 1, yn and yn minus 1 we already need them on the right hand side so you see this is uh, not really nice now if we write down this linear system in matrix form we get an equation which looks like that and you see we have the linear uh, system on the left hand side matrix times solution vector is equal to f of our solution vector y now if we solve this for y um, that's what 
actually we have here. We get something which looks like this. Y is equal to F of Y and this F is the right hand side. Yeah? Here we have the nonlinearity, here we have the inverse of our matrix. And this is a, a fixed point equation and the fixed point equation can be solved iteratively um, by doing fixed point iteration. It's the same thing we did last semester, but in uh, more dimensions. And again, um, in order for the iteration to converge, we need a Lipschitz condition. Yeah? There is a Banach fixed point theorem for higher dimensions also, which is actually the same, and it says um, our function, capital F, has to fulfill this Lipschitz condition. Okay, yes, so that's just a, a little repetition of what we did last time. And now I want to make uh, a few remarks on one of the exercises. The last of the all, the second last, I don't remember, of the exercises from last time. Uh, is the carpole problem. Um, and the task in the exercise is to solve the differential equation for the carpole problem numerically. Yeah? It's a non-trivial second order um, system. That's the two differential equations for the carpole problem. Um, we do not go into the modeling here, uh, because this is physics. Uh. Um, yes, in order to do the physics, I mean, one way to derive these equations is to really look at the forces of the system and then add them all up and you hopefully would get to these two equations. Uh. But this is an ugly job. This is really ugly. Because, as you can imagine, this system is not really trivial because it involves two coupled masses. Uh, if it's only one mass point, then you can look at the forces and it's not too difficult. But here we have two uh, coupled masses and um, then it's really non-trivial. What physicists do nowadays is there is an equivalent formulation of the Newton's axioms on the energy level. This is the so-called Lagrangian formalism. Uh, we, uh, we write down the, the total energy of the system and some constraints, so it's really related to Lagrangian optimization we had. Yeah? So you need the ener total energy of the system and, the, and some constraints and the constraints are about this mass is co coupled to this mass in such a way and so on. But this is physics, I mean in theoretical physics one you learn this a, a full semester. We don't do it here. So we just accept what physicists derive and it's these two equations. Yeah? Um, but let me now explain the system. So we have a card and this card can move in one dimension in x direction here. Yeah? Um, without any friction. And now here um, there is a stick which, which, is, which can rotate again in one direction yeah? like that. So it can, it can really move all the way around 360 degrees. And the stick has no mass and there is a mass point with the mass uh, um, lowercase m and the, the capital M is the mass of the card. Okay, and now these two differential equations describe the dynamics of the card pole. So, for example, you might start it 
with the pole in the upright position and then you, you just release it. And then of course the pole would swing down, you would get a kind of an oscillation. But of course, because here we have a mass and here we have a mass, when this upper mass moves down, then of course it would push the card in this direction somehow. Yeah? And you would get an, uh, quite a, an interesting dynamics. And uh, when I solved this exercise, I was kind of surprised about the results. Yeah? Um, I still can't perfectly explain the results. I'm, I mean, maybe I should talk to, a, to an active physicist. Yeah? Um, I will show you the results. Okay, but now how to solve this system? Um, first we should look at the equations. So the variables that we have here are x double dot. So, I mean, uh, if we have a variable x which depends on the time, I mean the independent variable here is the time. We want to know the time of evolution. So we are looking for x of t. How does um, and and theta of t? That's what we want to know. Yeah? These two solution functions. And what is theta? Theta is the angle of the pole to, to the upright position. So that's what we, when, when we know x of t and theta of t, then we know everything and we really can uh, draw the picture of how the card pole moves. So x and theta are the two uh, relevant variables. And then, because it's a physical equation, uh, it's a second order equation. Why are the, the dynamics in physics typically second order equations? That's quite simple, because, because of the Newton's axiom. Newton's, uh, is it, I guess, first axiom, m times the acceleration is equal to the force. That's the basic Newton's law. And the acceleration is nothing but what? Double derivative of the position. Double derivative of the position. Yes. The, the, the second derivative of the position. So that's x double dot, that's the equation. Yeah? m times x double dot is equal to the force. And this force is all the forces that act on, on this mass. Yeah? I mean this x double dot is the second derivative of the position. So this left hand side has to be equal to the sum of all the forces, the, all the external forces uh, that act on our mass. Yeah? And what we have here, the left hand side, that's what we call the inertial force. Yeah? Okay, and that's why we have a second derivative. Yeah? here. And as you can see, look, there is this term. The sum of the two masses times x double dot um, is equal to, uh, but uh, it's not correct. I mean, this is not the sum of all the remaining forces because we have a two mass system. And this two mass system, these two masses, they are coupled. And now since they are coupled, they can rotate around each other. And there is some rotational energy um, and, and that's why, you, as you can see, you get a term with theta double dot. Yeah? And theta double dot is the angular acceleration, the acceleration of the, the angle of this mass around the other mass. Yeah? Okay, yes. So we have these, var uh, these variables x and theta and their first and second derivatives. That's what all occurs inside these two equations. I mean, they don't all occur. As you can see, there is no x and no x dot. But there is theta, theta dot and theta double dot. 
Okay. Um, and now the question is, how do you solve such a system of two coupled second order differential equations with an initial condition? I mean, there is some initial condition, for example, we might say x of 0 is equal to 0 and theta of 0 also is equal to 0. So that means the, the, the card starts in the ori origin with the upright pole. That's the initial conditions. How do you solve this? State variables. State, variables. State, state variables. variables. What do you do with the state variables? Convert them second order I mean, what is these are the state variables here, or what? No. no. Yeah, we can convert the second order into first order. Yes, that's the point. Yeah, we convert the second order system into what? So we have two equations of second order. We convert them into what? Yes, but yeah, with different variables, but how many variables do we then have? Extra two. Two extra variables, yes. We will get uh, four equations of first order. That's the point. And why do we need two extra variables? It's coupled system x and theta. Excuse me? It's a coupled system with two variables, x and theta. That's right. X and theta, they are coupled, yes. So we need extra variables. Uh, yes, but why do we need two extra variables? Maybe we should look at how we do the substitution. I mean, we, what, let's, let's uh, look at it from the other side. Which variables do we want to eliminate? Oh, actually, no variables, but what, uh, what has to disappear? X double dot and theta. Yes, x double dot and theta double dot have to disappear. So that's why we now define new variables, and we, ca we may call them y1 is equal to x double dot y2 is equal to uh, x dot. Um, then, let me see, y3 is equal to theta double dot and y4 is equal to theta dot. Is that it? No, that's not correct. That's it. That's our new four variables we have to define. Huh? If, we, if we do this substitution, then we are finished. Why don't we need a substitution for x double dot? enough to get first order equation. Yes, that's enough to get a first order equation because look at this equation. Then y1 dot is equal to x double dot. Yeah? And that's, I mean, of course, we want to get a first order equation and that's what we get. Yeah? So we will replace x double dot by y1 dot and, and then look, these are, these variables, if we would only have these, it would give us a second order equation, uh, 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 sorry, a zeroth order equation. Yeah? We would have no derivative. But now, from the x double dot, we get y1 dot, and from the theta double dot, we get y3 dot, theta double dot. Yeah? So that's what you, what you have to do. You have to do these substitutions and you have to be careful that the, the, uh, on the left-hand side there only is 
one first derivative and on the right hand side of all the equations there must appear no derivative. Huh? That's how you have to do the transformation. And when you did this transformation, then you have four equations of first order and then you can apply runge kutta huh? Then you can directly apply runge kutta which is quite easy. Huh? So I hope you all have already your MATLAB program for runge kutta and then you directly apply it uh, to, these, to this system of four differential equations and then your runge kutta method will give you a table of values y1 of t, y2 of t, y3 of t and y4 of t. That's what you get. And from this list you have the dynamics of uh, your system. Yeah. And look, what we don't, we don't actually need the double dot variables. What you have here is only x and x dot and theta and theta dot. But that's, what, uh, that's completely sufficient in order to understand the dynamics of your system you know the location and the speed um, of all the relevant points. Actually, what the, I mean, what's really important uh, is this and this. Yeah? At any time point, at any time, you know x and theta. And if you know x and theta, then you know this point and with the angle you know this point. Okay, yeah, and maybe in order to give you an impression about how funny this system is, um, let's look at the solution. Uh, yes, we just start octave on this example. And here you see, this is the time, so this column is the time, and here we have the four variables, these four variables. So we actually have this zeroth column, which is the time. And now we get uh, this picture. Let's look at it a little closer. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I, I used a couple of different parameter settings. Um, so m, this uh, lowercase m is equal to 1 and capital M is equal to 100,000. So that means um, the mass of the, of the point of the, uh, at the end of the pole is very small compared to the mass of the card. So the card mass is almost infinite. Um, <coughs> and now here we have um, yeah, that's what we have, x and theta, x and theta. Huh? And you can imagine which curve is x and which one is theta. Of course this is x, because the mass of the card is almost infinite, so it wouldn't move. Huh? And you see, this is x and this is theta, and also you can see theta varies between 0 and 2 pi. Huh? So it starts at zero. Um, actually, I didn't start it exactly at zero. I started it at a very small angle uh, in order to define in which direction uh, the pole would fall. So it, it would fall down and it would turn around almost one full period, but not exactly because the energy is not enough to get it fully upright. Uh. And that's what happens. So it goes from 0 to almost 2 pi. So it goes all the way around like that and then it would move back again. I mean I stopped it here but it's, it's perfectly periodic. Huh? 
Okay, but of course this is, uh, I mean, this is the, the, the boringly simple case, yeah? because here it's like the count is fixed. Yeah? Now if, we, if the two masses are equal, both are equal to one, then it's more interesting. Now let's look. This, the, the red line is the movement of the card. So the card would, so what happens if the pole falls down like that? Yes, the card would move a little bit into this direction. The pole would move all the way down. And when, it's, when it goes down, it goes back into the other direction. So as the pole moves all the way down, at the beginning the card moves a little bit in this direction. And when it goes down, it goes more in the other direction. So when the, when the, the pole is uh, let's see, when, yeah, when the pole is already up again, that's here, it has moved in this direction, and now in this direction, and back again. Yeah. And here, when the pole is up again, then of course, then, ah yeah, that's interesting, look. We will see it. We will see it when we see the movies. Just a, a second. Um, and now, um, if the small mass is even bigger than the, 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 the large mass, then we get something like that or like that. But let's look at uh, the simulation. So now what I did is, when I have these, the, this tabula, then of course from x and theta I can reconstruct the picture. I can draw the picture. I can draw the picture because I have the position of the card, I have the angle, and now a little trigonometry, I need a cosine something uh, to get the absolute position of the, of the, the mass, um, and that's what we get here. And that's what you should do too. Now where is, ah, here we have our animation, yes. Oh, unfortunately. It's a little bit slow on this laptop, sorry. So it has already moved one full circle around. It's really slow. Oh, what's that? Um, why is this computer so slow? Yeah, Octave. It's only Octave running. Yesterday it was faster. Okay, yeah, sorry for that. Uh, and now doing the next animation. It's hidden here. Yeah, now you can see what happens. Now the two masses are equal. So this mass is the same as this mass. And this is plausible, what we have here. Yeah. I mean, of course the whole system would kind of rotate around the center of mass. But of course it's interesting because the center of mass also moves due to our uh, constraint, which is the card is fixed to this line. Yeah, okay, so that's this case. And now... Um, Yes. Now we have the case, the little mass of the point is ten times as big as the card mass. You can see it on the size of the ball. 
And that's kind of interesting, isn't it? The card moves all the way around here. It moves so far away from its initial position and that's what surprises me. I mean, what I would expect, let's think about the case where the, the mass of the ball is much larger than the mass of the card. If the card has zero mass, then what I would expect is if we start it here and the card has zero mass, then this, the, all the mass is centered here then I would expect this would fall vertically down and would just uh, move the card like here and vertically down it would go like that. But it doesn't. And that's kind of surprising. I mean of course th there might be a bug in my, in my program uh, or there might be numeric problems with Runge Kutta which cause the, this effect, but I don't believe, I don't believe so. What I believe is the following. Uh, look, uh, suppose here we have a large mass up here and here and no mass down here. At the beginning when the pole is in the upright position, um, this mass point, it cannot fall down here because it's fixed, it's fixed here it cannot fall vertically down. So in the beginning it has to move in this direction. It has to move like that. And now here it really wants to fall down and then it would push the card and you would get some kind of high speed of the whole system in this direction. Huh? And, and then it would move in this direction. The pole would move down all the way and now the mass is centered down here and then of course it would, but it has some speed in this direction so it really continues moving in this direction until it's up here and then all energy is, is consumed and it's fixed at the other end of some distance. So that's quite funny. I want you to play uh, with this. Yeah, and here we have uh, the, the point mass is 20 times the mass of the card. Isn't it funny? Yeah. If you look at this position, now it's upright and now it tries to push the card and it will push the card a little bit in this direction but now it, it's picking up speed in this direction But still, it's kind of surprising for me. Especially if we know that in our model there is no friction here. So the, the card moves without any friction. Yeah, okay, so uh, we can now finish it. And I mean, what I want to show with this example, and you will show it when you solve the exercise, is that differential equations is one of the primary methods in engineering for the simulation of dynamic systems. Huh? Dynamic mechanical systems, but also electrical systems, and uh, for all those who are, uh, who attend uh, the advanced control lecture, 
you know what differ differential equations are good for. Who, who is in the, the advanced control? Okay, so you know about all this. I mean, this is trivial for you, isn't it? Okay, nice. Uh, and I guess you had this example, or a similar one. Yeah, in the lab. In the lab. But in the lab you only have the, the, the case where the, uh, the, the, the angle theta is quite small. Yeah? You don't have the, 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 the pole swing up problem. Yeah? I mean, what we do in our lab in, in, in with machine learning techniques, we, we uh, teach robots. The robot learns to swing up the pole. So you, we are in this position and the robot really learns this task. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> the robot is better than me. Yeah. Oops, yeah. I mean it's, it's not, uh, it's actually the, uh, the uh, almost the three-dimensional task. The two-dimensional task, we have a device and, and it's possible. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, now we can continue in the lecture. And what we now do is the, the trivial case of differential equations, which is the linear case. Yeah? But this linear case is mathematically much more simple and it gives us some insight in what's going on. And that's why we look at the linear case. For real applications, most of the time, the linear case is not interesting. Yeah? Um, but yeah, let's go back to the card pole. If we look at small angles theta only, if this theta is really small, then we can linearize this system of equations and we get a system of two coupled linear differential equations and the solution can be done symbolically. Yeah? And that's what people in control theory most of the time do with this system. They linearize it and then of course it only works for, for small angles. Uh, but this is sufficient for controlling the pole in the upright position. But of, co uh, of course you have to start kind of in the upright position. And of course, I mean, this is easier. Even I can do it. Yeah. You see, it's easier than swinging it up all the, all the way. Yeah. But for the, for the full uh, swing up task, you need, of course, the nonlinear equations. Okay, yeah. So now we are looking at. Uh, first, we look at this really trivial example. I mean, this is kind of the simplest differential equation you can imagine. It's the first derivative of your solution function y is equal to a constant times y. And you all know the solution. Yeah? The solution is an exponential function. This is the solution. y of x is a times e to the power lambda x. Yeah? Because if we take the first derivative of y, then this gives us lambda times a times e to the power lambda x. Um, yes. So really the first derivative of this is a constant and actually lambda times y. Yeah? You take the first derivative, maybe we, we write it here. So y prime of x is equal to lambda times a times e lambda x, which is lambda times y of x. So you see, this function is a solution of this differential equation. For any a. For any a. So there is actually infinitely many solutions if this is my problem. But if the problem is solve this differential equation together with this initial value, then the initial value selects out of the set of infinitely many solutions one particular solution. Yeah? And the one particular solution is this. y of x is 
y of 0 times e to the power lambda x. Why is it so simple? Why is it so simple? We just replace a by y of 0. Look, we just have to replace, uh, to substitute x equals 0 in our solution. <coughs> then, so here, here, in here, we substitute x equals 0 and that's it. And then we get y of 0 is equal to a times 1. And here you see a is equal to y of 0. So this is the solution, the unique solution, for this initial value problem. I mean, it's really easy and basic to understand. And when you understood this, then you can generalize this to the multidimensional case, which is almost as easy. And we now look at the multidimensional case. So now the same thing in higher dimensions. A vector y, and here on the right hand side, we get a matrix A times y. And we have an initial, an initial value vector. Yeah? And again we try y of x is equal to some vector u times e to the power lambda x. Yeah? Um, and this, uh, we can easily use this ansatz because x is a scalar. x is not a vector, so we can easily write e to the power lambda x. And if we take the first derivative of this with respect to x, um, then the exponential function will reproduce and we get a factor lambda um, yeah, that's what we, uh, what we get. So, yeah, if we substitute this ansatz into this, maybe we should do this on the board. So, on the left hand side we get the first derivative with respect to x, which is lambda times u vector times e to the power lambda x. And on the right hand side we get a times um, u times e to the power lambda x. That's what we get. Okay, and now, as you can see, we have these two terms, which can never be zero, so we can cancel them out. And we get the eigenvalue equation. So it's really easy. Huh? We get this equation, which is an eigenvalue equation. Here we have a matrix times a vector u is equal to lambda times um, the vector u. So you see what we have to do next. We now have to solve this eigenvalue equation and the solutions, which are the eigenvalues, um, they determine our decay constant in the exponential. Yeah. We take an example. As an example, we take this matrix A. Yeah? A square matrix, which actually even is symmetric. 
and we take some initial condition. This is our initial vector at, uh, at point x equals zero. Okay, now we have to solve the eigenvalue. Um, which gives us, as you can see, I mean, we in the diagonal we subtract lambda and then we get a product of 1 minus lambda times 1 minus lambda minus the product of this diagonal, which is minus 4, is equal to 0. So this is the characteristic equations and the two, two solutions are lambda 1 equals 3 and lambda 2 equals minus 1. Okay, yes. So um, we now know these two lambdas, and as you uh, see, these lambdas occur in the exponential. So now we have two solutions. Yeah? One solution is, um, oh, and uh, sorry, I forgot to mention the eigenvectors to these lambdas are these two guys, yeah? which is easy to calculate too. And we get these two particular solutions. The first solution is the first eigenvector times e to the power lambda 1x. And the second is the second eigenvector times e to the power lambda 2x. Yes. I mean, yeah, this, our ansatz was, let's look back. That was the ansatz u times e power lambda x. And now we substitute our solutions. So we get these two solutions. And now because our differential equation is a linear differential equation, um, any linear combination of these two solutions is a solution too. So all the linear combinations, we take this solution here uh, times some coefficient uh, a1 and the second solution times a second coefficient. So uh, this is for all a1 and a2 the set of all solutions of this linear differential equation. Yeah, and, and you, you see um, because it is a two-dimensional problem here, we, ca we get um, two particular solutions which then span the space for these uh, coefficients. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and now, I mean, now um, we have to, from this infinite set of solutions, we now have to pick one solution which fulfills our initial condition. Yeah? And uh, what we do is we just substitute our initial value into, uh, into this equation. Let's go back, sorry. So we, we substitute x equals 0 here and x equals 0 here. So this gives a 1 here and a 1 here. And you see on the right hand side we get a1 times u1 plus a2 times u2. And on the left hand side, what do we get on the left hand side? Five and four. Yeah, 5 and 4. On the left hand side we get this vector. Huh? And that's what we have here on the next slide. y of 0 is equal to a1 times u1 plus a2 times u2 and this, look, this is the linear combination of these two vectors. Huh? And we can also write this as the matrix with u1 and u2 as the columns times this column vector a1, a2. Um, and this has to be, this product has to be equal to y of 0 and that's why we can write this equation. So this matrix, first eigenvector, second eigenvector, times these, uh, the vector with the coefficients is equal to 5, 4. This gives us this linear system and uh, if we solve it, we get a1 is equal to 9 half and a2 is equal to 1 half. And uh, 
so um, yes, if we yeah, and, and now we have to replace it he here. A1 is equal to 9 half times u1. This is u1. Uh, times 9 half gives us this vector. Uh, and then a2, which is 1 half, times u2 gives us this vector. Uh, times e to the power lambda 1x, which is uh, 3x, and lambda 2 was minus 1. So this is now the uh, solution for our initial value problem. Okay, yes. Any questions? I mean, this is so basic um, and it gives you a kind of a deeper understanding of what's going on in uh, first order differential equations. Okay, now let's go to another example. And this example is related to what we had before, to the card pole example, because it's a physical example again. And this is, I mean, this is the most popular differential equation on this globe. Huh? This is that differential equation everybody looks at, everybody solves it. Uh, in my, I mean, when I studied physics, the physicists, they call it the harmonic oscillator. Control theory people call it the mass damper system. Huh? Um, and what is it? So we have some fixed point here and we have a mass. And this mass is uh, connected to this fixed point by a linear spring. Huh? Uh, let's forget for a moment this damper here. What happens if there is a linear spring then, of course, the mass would oscillate around. So it, it depends on how you start it. If you, if you put the mass into the neutral position, then nothing would happen. But if you would initially take some elongation, then it would just oscillate around. And if there is no friction, which we assume, it would infinitely oscillate and you would get a solution uh, sine or cosine uh, uh, wave. Uh, um, yes. So now assume for a moment there is no spring, but there is a damper. And what is a, what is a damper? Um, hmm. It's friction. It's friction. It's just friction. Uh? Um, so we, we put this chalk here and there is friction so it wouldn't move. Because of the friction there would be no movement. Huh? Um, yes. So what would be actually the solution if there, would, there is only a damper? Yes, okay, yeah. There are, um, I mean, if there is only the damper, and this is kind of the damper, the, the chalk is lying here and it would stay here. It wouldn't do any movement. But it depends on the initial condition. If my initial condition, it, if initially it has some speed, let's put it here. If my initial condition is like that, then it would move. Huh? Actually, it's, it's, not allowed. it's not allowed to turn around. Let's, let's take the sponge here. It would move and, of course, the, it, it would uh, decelerate and, uh, and, and actually here quite fast, depending on the mass and the friction coefficient. Um, yeah. And that's the two extreme types of solutions for this second order differential equation that we expect. One type of solution is oscillations, a kind of a sine wave, and the other type is only friction, it would stop. It would stop quite fast and we will see what's the, what's the solution then. And this is, look at this equation, this again is the Newton's equation. Huh? Newton's uh, first law, mx double dot, 
is equal to, maybe we should write it also on the blackboard in, in this form. Look, mx double dot is equal to the sum of all the forces and the sum of all forces in this simple mechanical system is equal to minus b times x x dot minus k times x. And b and k are greater than zero. Look, I mean the force is negative, the friction force is negative. It always um, goes in the opposite direction of my movement. That's why we have a minus here. So the friction always is in the opposite direction of my movement. And then minus k times x, look this is the movement, we have the speed here. That's important. Huh? In the negative speed direction, and the, um, this is the, the force from the spring. Huh? And the force from the spring always is in the negative elongation. If I pull my spring in this direction, then the force of the spring is in the other direction. If I push my spring in the other direction, the force again is negative. That's why we have this right hand side. And if we bring this all to the left hand side, that's the second order equation we get. It's a really basic second order equation for such a spring mass system. Um, yes. Okay. Yeah, and here we have the explanation of the variables. X dot is the speed, mx dot is the resulting force on a point mass. Oh yeah, that's important. We assume a point mass. I mean, this picture doesn't look like a point mass, but it is a point mass. I mean, if, if, if the system would be like that, then you may have rotation effects uh, here and, and, that, and it would become ugly. Yeah? So we assume the mass is only a point. And that's important because any, any uh, finite size mass, which is not a point, can rotate and then it can pick up rotational energy and it would be completely different. Okay, then we have the friction and the elastic restoring for, uh, force. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and now what we do is, because we can only solve first order systems of differential equations, we transform this second order system into a first order system. Uh, uh, sorry, this, I mean this, what we have here is one dimensional, that's important. X is only a scalar, so it's only one dimensional, and now out of this one dimensional second order system, we make a two dimensional first order system. Okay, we do the same substitution we did with the card pole. X dot is equal to V and X double dot is equal to V dot. Uh, and now we get this first, actually this is the only, uh, the only substitution because this is the derivative of this substitution. Uh, and then we get the first order system. M times V dot plus B times V plus k times x is equal to zero. And as you can see now in this equation, we have two unknowns, v and x. And that's why we need a second equation. But we have the second equation, which is this. We write it here. So this now is our system of two first order equations. Yeah? And now we bring it into the, our normal form. So any terms with no derivatives to the right hand side, and now that's what we get. Okay, and if we write this in matrix form, then that's what we have. X dot V dot is equal, we have to divide this equation by M. Um, but now first look, let's look at the first equation. X dot is equal to V. And that's what we get with this line in the matrix. And V dot is equal to minus alpha times X minus beta times V. 
and alpha is k divided by m and beta is b divided by m. So that's now our uh, two-dimensional first order system. And it is linear, as you can see. There is this matrix A. I mean, now we could stop and you know how to solve it. Because we just did it. We just did it. To solve this, we have to do this. Yeah, look. Uh, the only thing that's different is this matrix. But it's, it's interestingly different because if we look at this matrix now, before in the example the matrix was was it one, one, two, two? I guess it was the was it? Yeah. And now we get this matrix. The fortunate case here was this is a symmetric matrix. And what did we do? We had to uh, compute the eigenvalues. What do you know about the eigenvalues of symmetric matrices? They are real. Uh, symmetric matrices have only real eigenvalues, no complex eigenvalues. But now the matrix is no longer symmetric. So now this matrix may have complex eigenvalues and now it's getting interesting. And it's very important that we get complex eigenvalues as you will see in a minute. Um, yes, so this is the system again and we make again as before the same ansatz which is e to the power lambda x as solutions. Yeah? And if we, if we substitute this ansatz, we have the eigenvalue problem, so we have to solve the correct characteristic equation, which is the determinant of the matrix uh, with subtracted lambda in the diagonal, and the determinant of this matrix is this, we get minus lambda times minus beta minus lambda, that's what we have here minus this product which is plus alpha so that's what we have if we multiply this out we get this equation and here we have the two solutions of this equation and you can see here now that uh, these solutions may be complex huh? um, you, we, we get complex numbers if the term under the root here is negative. Huh? Yes, okay. And the corresponding eigenvectors, they can also easily be calculated are uh, 1 lambda 1 and 1 lambda 2. Okay, yeah, and now we can look at the solutions. The solutions for this system are x v equal to a1 times u1. I mean, that's what we had before. It's nothing new. Huh? Uh, we just have to substitute now our new eigenvectors and the new eigenvalues. These are the two eigenvectors. And lambda 1 and lambda 2 are these two eigenvalues. These two eigenvalues. And now we, of course, we want to understand our system. And that's why we now have to look at these eigenvalues. Um, yes, okay, okay, yeah. And now this is t actually two equations. If we only look at the first equation, because for us it's sufficient to know x of t. Yeah? Typically we want to know the position of our mass point and then we will see how it moves. This is the solution for x of t a1 times e power lambda 1t plus a2 times e power lambda 2t. Okay, and as you can see here, it all depends on our lambdas. 
And remember, these lambdas may be complex. And that's why we do an analysis of these eigenvalues. Okay, and in order to simplify the following, I don't write the full term here. I just write my lambda as a complex number. So this lambda is some real part plus i, the imaginary constant, times um, the, the imaginary part, omega. Okay, and if we write it now like e to the power lambda t, then we get e to the power rt, r times t, plus i omega t. And now we can split this up in the product e to the power rt times e to the power i omega t. And this, as you remember, hope, I hope, from analysis, can be written as the cosine omega t plus i the sine omega t. And now you see how we get these, the oscillation part of our solutions from, uh, coming from the spring. Yeah? Um, that's the oscillatory part. And this here is the exponential decay or maybe even an exponential increase of the amplitude. But I mean, if we look at our spring damper system, um, at least <coughs> if there is no external force, then it's not realistic to assume that the amplitude in increases because nobody puts energy into the system. Huh? So in our um, homogeneous spring damper system with no external force, um, this R here should be negative. Yeah? Okay, oh yes, and uh, let's look at this part here. Um, we have the cosine omega t plus i times the sine of omega t. Look, what I said is this is the oscillatory part and this is the, the part that increases or decreases the amplitude. But, I mean, this is strictly speaking only true if the absolute value of this is constant. If this has a constant amplitude, and it's easy to see that this has a constant amplitude because the absolute value of this sum is equal to 1 all the time because of this equation. If, let's take the absolute value of this part here, which is the square root of um, the square of these two uh, components. And as you know, the square of the cosine plus the square of the sine of the same argument is one uh, always. Okay, and, and that's why the absolute value of this part is one, so this really determines the amplitude. Okay, and as we already said, um, because of the conservation law of energy, it is impossible that the amplitude increases without any external force. And therefore, um, this term determines if the solution is stable. What does it mean, stable? Stable means that it converges to some, um, to some limit value. And this converges only if R is negative. Um, and that's why we define, we define such a matrix A of such a system of differential equations, we call such a matrix stable if all eigenvalues have negative real parts. If the real parts of all eigenvalues are negative. That's why we call such a matrix stable. Okay, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so now let's go back and look at our eigenvalues. This is the important eigenvalue equation. Maybe we have to copy it to the blackboard. Okay. And um, maybe we should also remember uh, what beta and alpha is. Alpha is k over m and beta is b over m. Um, and this is the spring and this is the damper. or the friction. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. So this complex part, this part produces the oscillations. Yeah? Um, now we can um, look at the two extreme cases. Look at the case of the sponge here where there is no oscillation. Yeah? No oscillation means that this part um, is zero, is zero. Yeah? And this part being zero means, um, yeah, now we have to look. This is the real part. Yeah? And, and this is what we add to the real part. And this becomes imaginary if, if alpha is bigger than beta squared over 4. Yeah? Or if, if the whole term is negative. So if this is negative, then we have complex solutions. If it is positive, then we only have real solutions. Yeah? And only real solutions means that we only have the real part here, so we get an exponential decay. Yeah? Um, okay, so for... Uh, and alpha and beta, they have to be positive. Uh, so this means beta has to be bigger than 2 times the square root of alpha. Yeah? Yeah. That's the, the, the limiting uh, case. Yeah? If beta is greater than 2 square root of alpha, then we only have the exponential decay. And in terms of b and m, this is the inequality. And as you can see, B is the friction constant. Of course, we, we need to have enough friction. Yeah? We need to have enough friction. If the friction constant is bigger than this, then we get an just purely exponential decay. Okay, yeah, and now we can look at the diagram of solutions we get. Yeah? Now, here in this diagram, we have such a parameter, uh, zeta, which is equal to b divided by 2 square root of km. What is this? Let's go back. Look. We divide b by 2 square root of km. So that means this new variable zeta, if it is greater than 1, then we have only the exponential decay. And now here we have this variable 1.5, for example, which is this curve. You see it's purely exponential decay. Equal 1.0, this is the separating case. There is no, um, yeah, here we have no more oscillations, but as soon as this ratio becomes smaller than 1, then here you see we get one oscillation 
yeah, actually kind of one period. It goes in the negative and then positive and then it goes to zero. Um, and uh, if this is equal to zero, and look, this equal to zero means no friction. If there is no friction, we get the purely oscillatory solution with a fixed amplitude, no exponential decay. Yeah. Okay, and um, so now we solved this classical uh, harmonic oscillator uh, system. And now I want to have a different view at the solutions. Um, if we look at this picture, um, I mean, this, in this picture, here we have the time, and here we have two functions. The one is x and the other is v. Yeah? So this is x, uh, on an, I don't know, I, I mean it depends, it depends on the initial condition, actually it doesn't matter. Yeah? So one is x and the other one is v. Um, both uh, do have such a sine wave. And now if we look into this phase diagram where we have x here and v here, then we get a perfect circle. Huh? Then we get a perfect circle. Um, yes, I mean, you can see it in the other way. The parameter representation of this circle is we talked about parameter representation of curves. I hope you remember last semester when we talked about splines. Then, for example, if we say x of t is equal to the sine of t and uh, y of t is equal to the cosine of t, and if we now draw x and y into one diagram, x, y, we get a unit circle. So it's not surprising that in this x, v diagram we get a unit circle. Huh? if these are our two solutions. But now, um, if this is for the case, as you can see, with constant amplitude, but if we now look at the solution where we have our sine wave times the exponential decay, then here, of course, we get such a, such a spiral because we now have the sine of t times e to the power minus uh, uh, some lambda t and here too. Yeah, so now we get such a spiral here. The interesting thing is that here in this phase diagram we have a um, because it's a circle, we immediately see that the solution is periodic. Huh? So the circle tells us a we have a periodic solution. The spiral here tells us there is no periodic solution. Huh? As you can see here, I mean, this is not periodic. Okay, yeah, um, yeah, you can see, I mean, here you see the parameters, alpha equal one and beta equal zero. Beta equal zero means no friction. And here we have a little bit of friction. Actually, let's look at, uh, I mean, what was the condition for, uh, the condition for purely exponential solution, um, it was beta greater than 2 square root of alpha. Beta the, greater than 2 square root of alpha. Square root of 0.5 is 0.7 something times 2 is 1.4. So beta would have to be greater than 1.4 uh, in order to 
eliminate all the oscillations. Okay, yes. Now um, let's get back to nonlinear uh, differential equations. Um, I mean, we completely understood now the linear first order differential equations. Yeah? There is not much to say. Um, and now let's make it a little bit nonlinear. Huh? Look at this system. Oh, let's look at the time. Oh, yeah, we don't have much time left. So maybe we just in, I just introduce this system. Um, look, if we would cut it here, it would be a linear system. Huh? It depends on y1 and y2 and here too. And now we add two simple quadratic terms. Oh, it's actually, yeah, I mean it's, it's quadratic in the single variables times the other variable. Um, why do we look at such a differential equation? I mean, now we should, uh, in order to really perfectly understand this, we should dive a little bit into multidimensional analysis, which would cost us too much time. But I tell you, I mean, if you have such a, a multidimensional function, so we have this function y with two components, yeah? and now we can expand this function into a Taylor series. Yeah? If we expand such a multidimensional function into the Taylor series, then we get um, a constant term, a linear term, a quadratic term, a cubic term, and so on, as we have it all the time in Taylor series. Yeah? Um, and this here would be the linear term. Yeah? And then comes such a quadratic term, yeah, actually this is a combination of a, of a quadratic term and multiplied with this y1, it's actually a third order term. Um, yes, but yeah, it's, it's a third order term. And, um, but from the theory of such type of nonlinear equations, uh, we know, and the Russian mathematician Lyapunov developed this theory, and he found out that from the Taylor expansion of this function, we need some terms, and it's a combination of second and third order terms, and that's what they call this, the so-called Lyapunov coefficient. And uh, for the Lyapunov coefficient, one has to use this term and this term here. And these Lyapunov coefficients, they are quite interesting because they determine for nonlinear differential equations the behavior. Yeah? And uh, this behavior goes in a similar direction to what we have seen here in the linear case. Now look at uh, I mean, just for a minute to finish it, we look at solutions of this system. I mean, it's easy. You just take runge kutta apply it, and you get solutions. That's how I, I, how I calculated these solutions. Yeah? And we get such an uh, oscillatory solution with a kind of exponential decay, and it's not surprising that we have such a, uh, a spiral behavior uh, in in our phase diagram. So here we have y1 and y2, the two variables. Um, okay, so so far everything is easy and it looks like in the nonlinear world everything is the same as in the linear world. But as you might guess, it may become very much different from the linear case. So really very interesting effects may occur in nonlinear systems. Um, and uh, yeah, that's actually what we talk we will talk about on Wednesday. Um, for example, um, when we vary this parameter alpha here, 
we will see surprising results. Uh, um, we may, uh, for some values of alpha, there are more than one possible solutions, even with the same initial conditions. Uh, so we can get multiple solutions. Um, we, we will also look at chaotic behavior, because chaotic behavior appears, may appear, when we have non-linearities. And we will see other quite simple differential equations with really interesting chaotic behavior. Okay, thank you for today.